Colossians chapter four. Uh, but before we do, Lisa, would you pray for us? Yep. Uh, God, we thank you so much for the fact that you have created us to be relational people, uh, that we get to have deep and meaningful friendships. And God, if we're missing that right now, I just pray that you would give us opportunities to seek out someone who maybe is feeling uh, the same way that we are. Uh, God, I pray that you would help us today as we are going through a Wednesday that feels maybe like a Thursday. Uh, Lord, that you would just encourage us and give us the strength that we need and the wisdom that we need and help us as we are uh, reading your word today, that you would help us to understand um, even the meaning and how these words today can be applied to our lives. We love you, God, and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So uh, if you've not been with us before, the pattern on the screen and the document that's linked in the post is the pattern that we follow. Uh, if you're looking for more help around prayer or reading scripture, there are some specific series linked that you can find there. Uh, today, there are a couple specific names that if you're just reading the Bible, maybe names like when you're reading Leviticus, that you're like, I don't know what that means. And you just skip it. And so I've dropped in a couple commentary references uh, to try to help if you want to dig a little deeper into some of those names. Um, and we'll talk about who those people are, who commentators think they are. Um, and then, you know, really, I think the substance is kind of the way that they're described and how we think about relationships as well, which is why I asked the question that I did. So uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. By the way, Dom, I think about the ice cream said, uh, you are my hero. I love ice cream, but gravity and metabolism. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday, I was in a meeting with Dom yesterday, and I, what did you say, Dom? Like, I don't remember what it was. He was justifying, like, it doesn't matter, essentially, and it, and I, I don't remember. It was hilarious. It was very, very funny. So, uh, <laughs> Carrie, good morning. Good to see you. Glad you're here. All right, so here we go. Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9 says, Tychicus will, you, uh, will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. So if you've been with us kind of up to this point, the way that the letter has largely been divided, uh, it's four chapters. We're just about done with it. The first two chapters, Paul is really breaking down um, the kind of orthodoxy, right thinking, right believing stuff, uh, and trying to push back against false teaching. And then in chapters three and four, it's really about orthodoxy, right living, right doing um, out of that. And so here we find um, this aim of, uh, okay, now I've, I've kind of given you my final instructions. And here it's almost like the oh, I want to make sure you know something personally. Um, these letters, if you don't know this, right, scripture is not just one book that got downloaded to a single individual and they just wrote from beginning to end. It's really a library of books that God inspired over the course of generation after generation through a bunch of different authors. And so this is an actual letter that Paul wrote in the first century from prison to the church at Colossae. So that's why we see something this specific. Here's, I think Dom gave it to me. He said, Phil, being the elderly person that I am, my memory, oh, he doesn't remember. I, it was good. It was really good. Uh, Craig, I bought a half gallon of haagen strawberry, got home, didn't have room in the freezer, ate the whole thing. <laughs> if I'm being honest, I could have eaten another one. <laughs> There's something about ice cream where I think our stomachs just love it so much. They're like, you know what? We'll expand. We'll make yeah, room. Yeah. This I don't feel like I don't feel like that is necessarily the case for me with ice. I mean, I can eat ice cream. It's fun. I like it. But I, I get to a place where I'm like, oh, I'm kind of good. But what is like that for me is we did a really nice dinner with some friends last week. And it was at Ruth's Chris. And I like ate a steak. And I was like... I could eat that same thing again right now. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm not full at all. So I'm not done. <laughs> yeah. That's everybody's got their thing. You know, you guys have ice cream. I have filet mignon. It's there we go. There we go. <laughs> mine is a lot more expensive. So depending on the ice cream, I guess. And the filet. that's true. That yeah. All right. So uh, as we jump into these verses and we look kind of, we see it really broken down into two individuals. Tell us about the first individual that we're meeting in this passage. Yeah. So uh, Tychicus or Tychicus, however um, you say it, I'm just going to call him Tick. Uh, but he was 
first mentioned in the book of Acts. And so if you're reading chronologically, you're going to run across his name in the book of Acts in chapter 20. And Acts is written by Luke, who I think uh, Paul is going to mention in the next couple of days. Um, Luke was a doctor, wrote the gospel of Luke. We've talked a little bit about him before, um, but he ended up... <clears throat> uh, he ended up with Paul kind of chronicling, chrono, chronicling uh, what go. Paul was doing in his ministry. And so that's the first mention that we get of, um, of Tychicus. Then, then we move into a couple of the other letters that Paul is writing, and we see his name a couple more times. And so he was somebody who was coming alongside Paul. He was a messenger. Um, one of the things that I was reading is that he was... Um, Let's see. So he breaks it down. He, he gives him kind of a resume of three things here in in uh, Colossians. He says he's greatly loved or this beloved brother, which um, was described as no small feat. If you think of where they they started hanging out or, or where they were at this time, they're in Rome. Um, and, and to be a beloved brother would have been kind of a big deal uh, in Paul's inner circle. So that's kind of a... a, a thing there. And then he says he's a faithful minister or a faithful servant. Um, he's dependable. And when you think about all the people that are described as servants of the Lord, Jesus Jesus described himself as a servant. And so here we've got where Paul is kind of, not he's elevating him to Jesus status, but you know he's, he's giving him a good resume here. And then he calls him a follow, um, what does he say? I wrote it. Oh, a fellow servant. I wrote follow servant. That doesn't make sense. Um, but he's giving him this, this equality with himself. Um, so Paul is giving him this equality with himself and they're both servants of the same Lord. And what I love about what Paul does here is he's really saying, Hey, this guy might be the messenger of my letter, but without him, nobody sees it. Nobody reads it. Nobody benefits from my words. And so because of that, we really are on an equal playing field. He might not have written the words, but he's the one delivering them to you. And so he deserves to be treated with the same level of respect and honor as if Paul were there himself. Well, and I think it it underscores so much of what Paul talked about when we studied Ephesians, right? That we're all one body. We're a part of this bigger body. And so like just because we have different functions doesn't mean that one of us is better than the other. And so for Paul, he recognizes, yeah, you're reading words that I wrote or, you know, depending on the specific letter, maybe I um, dictated and someone else wrote. Right. But uh, the, the all the hands that got it to you are equally important. Like yeah. ultimately, if we don't all do our part, like the way that we've been gifted, then none of this works. And so I, I think that it's such an important thing for us to, to know about. And I think for Paul here to like model genuine friendship, genuine appreciation. Um, I think, you know, he obviously had, Paul had people around him, right. That, that were probably the same kind of layer we would think about in relationships, right. Mm -hmm. He had people that he knew that were just acquaintances. He had people that were, you know, friends or, you know, people that he was more familiar with. And then it's obvious that he had this kind of committed core of relationships that when it was like, Hey, uh, I can't take this over to the church at Colossi. Can you take it for me? Yeah. What are you doing? Oh, I'm in prison right now. Got it. I'll be right there. You know? And when we think about what it meant for this level of faithfulness in the first century, this wasn't like, can you forward this email for me? This was, can you risk your life? Can you come see me? Um, can you take this letter that in some cases may get you put in jail? Like, can you do all of that while continuing to live your life in the first century and meet the needs and demands of just surviving? Um, that's a pretty unique set of friends that are willing to kind of go to that length for you. And I think that's what Paul is so thankful in the life of Tychicus that he is uh, seeing and experiencing. Um, yes. And, and Rome and Colossi were not, near one another. Um, yeah. And so it, the thought is, is that Paul's shipwreck that he talks about in second Corinthians that uh, Tychicus was on the same ship. And so that was getting to Rome. Now he's got to get back. Um, so, I mean, he's he really risking his life to make sure that these letters get delivered uh, on behalf of Paul. And, and I think we get some descriptors in the text, right? Beloved brother, faithful minister, fellow servant. And I think they, it's really helpful to look at those. 
I would be curious if you're watching, like, you know, what are some of those attributes for you? Not just the individual attributes that made your friend your friend in high school, but like the universal attributes that you would say this this is what makes me appreciate and know that this person's a good friend in my life. What are some of those attributes that you find really helpful? Uh, I think it'd be cool to see those from one another. I also think um, something that Paul highlights here that I think sometimes we forget about is in the life of other followers of Jesus, this aspect of not just like, hey, I like you and we have fun together, but like we make one another better. And I think that Paul had um, th this idea of how are we uh, spurring one another on would be kind of the language he would use. Um, but not only that, like how are we helping one another on this bigger mission? And so I think some of us, like we would say, hey, friends are people who are trustworthy or friends are people who whatever, I like to laugh together. Maybe those are yours. Drop them in. That's great. Um, but what are some of those that you would say, hey, these are some aspects or attributes of friends uh, that I've had that like these things actually make me better. These things remind me of who I'm supposed to be as a parent or as a spouse, uh, as a team member, as a coworker, as a boss, whatever. Uh, what are some of those attributes? Because I think one of the things that we often experience in friendship is I think that we experience the lessons of friendship in the rearview mirror. Oftentimes it's difficult mm -hmm. to predict and like prescribe the kinds of things because we're just not as aware of it. So if we can be aware of those attributes, I think it helps us if you're looking for more meaningful relationships to take some of those more fringe acquaintances and invest in the right relationships that can really help. Hmm, that's good. Awesome. So as you guys are writing about that, what are those attributes or aspects of friendships that are really helpful for you? We'll look at real quick this uh, next verse in verse eight. He says, I have sent him to you for this very purpose. And so mm -hmm. you're like, what, what purpose is he talking about? And then he tells us that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. W what is Paul like? Why is this a relevant detail given the circumstances? Well, I mean, we've, we talked about it a lot, obviously in the first century, they, they didn't have uh 24 hour news coverage where they're talking about Paul all the time and kind of what's going on and, and how he's doing in prison. Um, they didn't have email where he could just shoot out a quick summary of, of what the day was like. And so the, the church knew that he was in prison, but they had no idea if he was still alive. They had no idea how he was doing. They had no idea if his, um, execution had been set. Like there was just a lag in, in time here. And so uh, it's important for his churches to be encouraged by knowing how Paul is doing and what's going on. And so, you know, that that's part of it. And I think the other part too is we've talked about this, Paul has never been to Colossae. And so uh, for all we know, this is the first time they've actually heard from him um, as close to his person as they've ever been. And what a great encouragement that would be that they're hearing from uh, this, this renowned church planter. Um, and so this, this opportunity for them to get kind of firsthand information and knowledge from Paul. Yeah. Well, I think there's probably a point at which there are people wondering, Hey, is Paul going to keep doing this? Like is, he's in prison again. Is this really worth it? Is he going to keep investing? Um, and I think probably there's a sense of like, Hey, I'm not backing down. I mean, if you'll remember where we were two days ago on Monday, Paul goes, Hey, I have a prayer request. My prayer request is that God would open the door of opportunity for us to share the gospel. So, I mean, he's literally in his last chapter to them saying, Hey, I'm still in it. Like, not only that, it's not like, hey, you won't believe what I'm going to do when I get out of here. It's like, hey, while I'm in here for sharing the gospel, would you pray that I could share the gospel? So I think it is this like, yeah, things aren't always peachy, but I'm still in it. And I think that probably in the first century, there were times people wondered, you know, and like the dude got shipwrecked. And I mean, there, there were just lots of things that happened for Paul, uh, was beaten in prison multiple times. Um, and no, I don't think anybody would have blamed him. Like at some point you're like, yeah, I get it, dude. And he just never backed down. It's amazing. Yep. Uh, Crystal, fun fact, Thomas Jefferson loved ice cream so much. He had an ice house 
built in 1802 at the White House to store his vanilla ice cream. Seriously? An extreme delicacy before refrigeration was available. Summers in 1970, George Washington often spent upwards of $5,000 in today's value for ice cream treat. That, look at that. We got, we got ice cream thread today. That's impressive. <laughs> uh, that is amazing. Um, Pam, total honesty when life gets off track, flying to be with one another when in heartbreak. That, that Talking about friends and what makes good friends, I think that's, uh, yeah, that that's such a big deal. I, and I think, like, I've had friends where something is messed up or whatever, and they're just like, hey, I'm on a plane, you know, and that somebody would just like hit pause on their life to support you in a time of need. Uh, that's a really, really big deal. And, um, you know, those are those are friends worth hanging on to for sure. And I think that idea of what does it mean to tell the kind truth? Like for me, that's this idea of total honesty, but not like being intentionally hurtful or brutal about it. Uh, Ronald attributes in friendship is trust, loyalty, even if it if they don't believe as I do. Uh, many of my bosses had these qualities and my best friend outside of my work, my wife certainly does. Plus, uh, she has love for everyone. That's awesome. Megan, I think it's helpful when a friend is honest and upfront when you ask a friend how they're doing and they tell you uh, they tell you the truth, having humility with you. I think this enables your relationship to grow closer. Vice versa, when a friend asks me how I'm doing, do I tell them the truth and allow uh, them to grow with me in the ups and downs? Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. I mean, I think all of us feel that pressure when somebody says, I mean, maybe we don't feel that pressure, but when somebody says like, how you doing? You know, there's the answer of like, oh, I'm good. You know, like I'm fine, whatever. Uh, versus like, hey, if you're not really fine, then how about you be honest about that? And and I've always appreciated the folks that when it's like, like yesterday, actually, this happened with somebody on our staff. I, I know him well, but like, we're not super close or anything. And I just said, hey, man, how you doing? And he goes like, ah, not great today, actually. And he just like kept walking. And I was like, nope, nope, we're not done with this conversation. <laughs> so, you know, what does it look like? And then I think whether people realize it or not, like that's a that's a test for us to go, okay, are we going to follow up? Are we in, Or if somebody, you know, I think when when you get really close with somebody, even if you're like, how you doing? And they're like, oh, I'm fine. And you're like, really though? Like, yeah. what's up? You know, because you can see through the normal pleasantry level that somebody else might just let go. So that's good. Uh, Megan and Craig book club field trip to ice cream. Amazing. <laughs> that um, We just got uninvited. That's, that's what that yeah, was. That's, I mean, it's that's fine. fair. It's not even a big deal. We're, we're, I mean, if you guys are doing a, a field trip for steak though, I'm in. Uh, You'll just Greg, invite yourself. Yeah. Greg, honesty is key for me. 99% of the time I give complete honesty and I'd like to get it in return. Doesn't always happen. Unfortunately, that's true. Yeah, I think that's true. And it takes time to earn it. You know, like I think lots of times we want friendships when we need them. But the time to build a friendship is like before the crisis, before the before the issue, you know. And so I think the hard thing about community and relationships is the best time to start building them was yesterday. And so, um, you know, like going, oh, no, I'm in a hard spot. For sure, start building relationships. But you can't ask relationships that have been around for a really short time to act like they've been friendships that have been around for a long time. If you watch that happen, basically, they become like weeds, right? Like right. they grow up really far, but they're, the the roots are so shallow that at some point they just kind of break off because you're like, I don't, I don't have enough trust with you. We don't have enough, you know, shared uh, experience. Like, you gotta, you gotta slow cook it. There is no instant pot friendships, not good ones. So, no. uh, Becky important attributes in a friend for me, uh, are someone who is honest about who they are and acceptance and accepting of who I am. Uh, someone who is true to their word. Uh, don't say it if you don't mean it. That's good. Dom, for me, uh, true friendship is when you love uh, another and they love you back to your point. Uh, I see, uh, our most va valuable resource and when people spend is when people spend time with you that speaks volumes. Absolutely. My wife is the same way. She's a quality time person. So I think some of that's some of that's personality, but yeah. some of it's just like, what do you need? Period. So yeah. awesome. So uh, obviously Paul is giving us a little bit of a breakdown. Those are some added like helpful things for us to be thinking about lots of stuff about honesty and openness in there. Um, 
the the attributes that Paul gives are maybe helpful for you to even think about in some of your friendships. Maybe they're there and you just haven't recognized it. Maybe they could be there in some of the relationships. You just need to call that out of the relationship to say, hey, you know what? This fall, I really need to, I'm feeling called to, I want to invest in, I want to make a difference with, like, can you help me with that? You know, maybe we could do that together or whatever. Like just have the conversation. You'd be surprised. Uh, there are people in your life that are like, down to do that. There's a pastor buddy who's older than me, really good dude in Ohio that I met through a network that we're a part of as churches. And uh, I mean, he knows some stuff going on in my life right now, especially like with my mom. And so yesterday he he texted me and a couple other guys and he's like, all right, like when are we getting on a Zoom and, and connecting and supporting each other? Because like he knew stuff was going on. And I just think there are more people in your life probably than you realize that are able to do that. You just got to let them in. So and I would say, open your eyes and who needs you to be that person to them? Yeah. Um, how how can you be investing in the lives of other people who need you in, in whatever they're going through right now? Yeah, that's good. That's good. And then obviously here at the end of verse eight, he says, you know, the, the hope is that all this is going to encourage them. That like as difficult as what they're going through is that they would hear like, hey, this guy, Paul still trusting God, like your day may be difficult. You may be having to combat false teachers. You may, you know, lose some friendships in this, in this season or this moment of people that don't think or believe the way you do. Um, but like, it's worth it. Hang on, keep going, you know? And then he introduces us to a second individual in verse nine. Tell us about him. Yeah. So here we've got um, Onesimus who we talked a little bit, um, Phil, last week when we were ending chapter three, starting um, chapter four, talking about the relationship between bond servants and their masters. And so we we introduced Onesimus and uh, Philemon. Um, but here, Paul, it's almost like, oh, this is why you kind of dug into that servant master relationship. Um, just a couple verses ago. And so we're seeing here that he is talking about a one particular person and he describes him. And I love this as faithful and beloved brother. And that would have been so contrary to how anybody in Roman culture would have described their slave. Uh, this puts him on an even playing field with his master and with everyone else in the church. And that was just so counter cultural. Hold on mom moment. Get over here. Nice. Hey, have a great day. Oh, eighth grade. Amazing. She looks so cute. So cute. apparently you don't call eighth graders cute. So. Oh, she looks lovely. Is that a better word? <laughs> that's great. That's great. What, she looks cool. What should, what word yeah. should I use? I don't know what it is to be honest right. with you. Uh, I could just start like going really off. Like, man, you look so fly. And she'd be like, what? No, don't say that. Just try it out. <laughs> don't do Next that. Time. Next time I see her. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for that mom moment. I appreciate That's that. That's awesome. Um, but it, it just would have gone against the grain. And he's already kind of set it up. Um, and, he, and he really does a good job of describing, uh, especially with their masters, that they should be treated justly and fairly. And here he's just kind of, um, I don't want to say digging in, but definitely making his point that you know, when this letter comes and he's actually sending probably a partner letter with it um, called Philemon. So directly to the uh, master. Um, I'm looking over here because I have it open. Nice. Um, but it's one of these things where Paul's flipping everything upside down and he is saying, yes, this may be the cultural norm, but in Jesus's culture, we're doing things different. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, we see a lot, obviously, when we go look at the book of Philemon about what this interaction looks like, but it is really interesting, the contrast between Tychicus, who is clearly like a co-laborer, a co-worker of Paul's and is not a slave in the first mm -hmm. century. He refers to him as a servant, which in Greek, that word is a doulos, which is translated bond servant or slave. It's mm. the same word. Um, and then he, you know, gets down a couple of verses later in verse nine and Onesimus, who actually is a doulos, he does not refer to as a servant. He refers to only as a brother. I don't think that that was an accident. Right. 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 <laughs> and I love that he uses the same 
phrase that's here. He uses the word faithful and he uses the words beloved brother. Um, yeah. But you're right. He doesn't, and probably very intentionally does not use that same right. word. And I just think there's a level of nuance and thoughtfulness. And, you know, we think about all the different ways in 2020 that we're thoughtful about like not triggering someone or else. And we're just like, Oh my gosh, can I just like, can I just say what I mean? You know? And I think there's something to that, but I also think there's something that's just kind about understanding like, Hey, how is someone else going to hear what I'm about to say? And yeah. especially somebody that I'm friends with, like, how can I make sure that I'm really, you know, instead of Paul, it can be pretty sarcastic. He can be pretty cutting at times. And um, there, you can just sense a tenderness here in the way that he interacts mm -hmm. and deals specifically with Tychicus and Onesimus. So, and I uh, love when we get into the next part of this, instead of using the word he, um, you know, up above, he's talking about uh, Tychicus and he uses the word that I have sent him for this very purpose mm -hmm. so that you may know how we are doing and that he may encourage you. Here he's using the word they. And right. so he's putting both of his messengers on the same level and he is saying, even this one who is a slave in your home, he is going to tell you what is going on with me. Yeah. And I think, I mean, obviously um, you just wonder how did, how did reading this letter from Paul change Onesimus standard in the culture and the you know community he was a part of because Paul is very clearly elevating his status. Uh, if if you get in if you get into Paul's letters, uh, it's usually like a really good thing or a really bad thing, and he ends up on the right side of that equation. So, but in that last, in, you already referenced it a little bit in that last sentence. It says they both Tychicus and and um, Onesimus will tell you uh, of everything that has taken place here. Now he goes from when you look in verse eight. He's like, Here, here's what's going to happen. Tychicus is going to just tell you how I'm doing. But Tychicus and Onesimus, they're going to give you a breakdown of everything that's happened, right? And so, I mean, that dichotomy is, you know, it's on purpose. What do you think Paul is trying to highlight here? Well, I, I mean, I wonder if he's giving Onesimus an opportunity to talk about the transformation that has happened with Paul uh, as, as he encountered Paul. Uh, you know, background on, it, on on Onesimus is that he had stolen something from Philemon, his master, and then he had taken off, they think, first to uh, Ephesus and then ended up in Rome where he met Paul, where he met Jesus in that. And so I wonder if it's giving him this platform to share this story of transformation because he had gone from um, being someone who was stealing and who was probably a little bit bitter in heart to someone who is so passionate about Jesus that he's willing now to risk his life, not only on the journey back to Colossae, but going back to his master where the punishment for stealing would have been uh, to be killed and running away. I have a feeling like that was just an immediate death sentence uh, yeah. in the culture. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, I think, we get a picture from Paul here of a bunch of different stuff, right? We get a picture of friendship. We get a picture of kind of co-mission together of really like some specific life stuff, not just theology, not just what are you doing with the theology, but almost like a modeling that's pretty unique from Paul in his letters. We just don't normally see this. Uh, and if we do see this, usually it's so specific uh, this one is almost kind of already principalized for us. Paul is talking about these attributes and, um, you know, what they're going to tell them. But, you know, he's like, I'm not going to spell it out all in the letter. Like you guys, you'll talk about it. So I trust them to share with you accurately how I'm doing and what's been going on. Right. So I think those are super, super helpful. Carrie, in talking about kind of the way we care for other people and just intentionality for what she said, she said, I'm working really hard on not using triggering words and phrases when I'm talking with someone who views an issue differently than I do. It takes mindfulness uh, to know how they will hear things. It really does. But I think like, I, I mean, are, are there going to be times that we say something wrong? Absolutely. And are we're going to have to ask for grace and forgiveness? Absolutely. Um, and I think the, the closer we are in friendship and relationship, I think two things happen. One, it's easy for someone who would normally be an offended party to give you the benefit of the doubt. I also think it becomes more and more natural for you 
uh, to understand the best ways to approach someone in a way that is going to be most helpful and they're going to hear it. But it's, you know, it's this tension we talk about of when I seek to be um, understood before I seek to understand, that's the wrong sequence. And when I seek to be right over having a relationship, that's the wrong sequence. And so I think Paul is modeling a healthy approach to both of those ideas in these verses here. Uh, Dom said, there's also an element of Paul lending his credibility to Onesimus as a way to get him accepted by another group of people. Great leaders do this all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Paul is, is definitely lending his credibility. He's saying, Hey, like he's with me, like we're in, we're in this together. So that's good. So in just a minute, we're going to talk about kind of application. What do we do with this? How do we think about this? Um, you know, when we talk about the kind of the principalizing bridge, Sometimes we're like, well, what's the false teaching here? And like, how do we do that? And okay, so what is that today? And how do we do that? And so we take what was true in the first century, what's timeless, and then what is, how does it uh, get contextualized to today? Honestly, this is a lot easier uh, because the principles are kind of already there from Paul. So, so hopefully you already have some ideas in your mind of how you would apply this. So just drop those into the chat. Um, and then our executive producer, Crystal, will be... Oh, she's already working. She's already working behind the scenes, getting it done. She is. Um, but drop that in the chat for application. We'll drop it here. Uh, for you, Lisa, what are ways you're thinking of applying this passage into your life today? Well, I've been doing, I'm in, I'm going to school for um, leadership stuff. And so I, I kind of had that lens on as I was reading here. And one of the things that caught me was how am I talking about the people that I lead? Um, how do I describe them? And whether it's my family or people at work or, or friends that I have some, some kind of influence with, how do I talk about them? Am I uh, elevating them and giving them this resume, describing them as faithful and fellow servants and greatly or beloved, um, greatly loved or beloved? Like, or am I kind of tearing them down to, to lift myself up? And so um, we never see Paul do that ever. Oh. He's constantly praising the people that are helping carry Jesus's message to more and more people. And so how can, how can I take nuggets away from that? Yeah, that's great. That's a very, very thoughtful one. Uh, Greg, by the way, Cassie, is, she's, he's asking, how did your in injection go? Um, I don't know if I've seen her on yeah, here this morning yet. We were praying for an injection. She was supposed to get yesterday afternoon. So that's a good question, Greg. Uh, all right. Anything else that you're wondering about or thinking about as we wait for folks uh, to give us some of their application? The other thing that stuck out to me today was um, with uh, Tychicus doing these these small tasks th that can feel menial in some way. When when you think about who Paul is, and to be honest with you, most people would never know who he was, who Tychicus was, or unless Paul had written his name, we would have had no idea who is delivering this letter, except that Paul called him out. And so what are those menial tasks that I do day to day that may not seem like they matter, but maybe in the, in the big scheme of things, they are a big deal. Yeah. I read, I read that. Can I just read something that I read? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, it says, we moderns run the danger of dichotomizing our lives into religious and non-religious, sacred and secular, great and small. But our Lord said, so Jesus said and did otherwise, I always do the things that are pleasing to him in John 8. Jesus, living in a human body for 33 years, never once performed a non-sacred act. God is in all our little deeds, and we ought to ask him to keep reminding us that it is so. We need to pray for this in our regular prayer times, as well as in a thousand brief sighs. How liberated our lives will be then. Mm. I just thought that was such a good reminder that Jesus did little things too, but for him, it was always this, this kingdom mindset, this bigger, he just knew that he was part of something bigger. And what happens when we kind of put our minds that way, this, like just like that? Yeah, no, it's so good. And I forget, I think it might've been Peter somebody was talking about, and they basically said like, Hey, we've basically written down like the cliff notes of Jesus ministry. There literally wouldn't be enough pages right. on the planet yes, to write down everything that he said and did. And you're like, okay. <laughs> like, and so, yeah, I mean, the, from the miraculous, the insane stuff that nobody had ever seen before to just, I just think about the moments of sweet tenderness, right? Where like, 
you know, those moments where the religious leaders are trying to shoo kids away. Mm-hmm. And Jesus is like, no, no, let the little kids come to me. And they don't have a need. Like they don't have a need. They just literally come, probably sit in Jesus' lap and he listens to them tell stories that make no sense. And he plays with their hair and he gives them good hugs. Like that's the creator of the universe doing that. And so because to your point, he's doing it, understanding the kingdom of heaven that's being revealed on planet earth, like everything he's doing is with that mission in mind. And we get to have the same opportunity if we Mm -hmm. align ourselves with him. So, Well, and if we're doing everything as into the Lord, which is what we're called to do. do. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Carol uh, of a good leader who says little when her work is done, her aim fulfilled, they will say we did this ourselves. Love this leadership quote. That's fun. Hmm. Uh, Dom, who do I trust enough to lend them credibility? Do I even have credibility to lend? Oof. How am I supporting those in my community that are in ministry so that God's message gets out? That's good. And I think, you know, Paul does such a good job of even people like Onesimus, right? Clearly is not at the same level in terms of kind of leadership structure for Paul. He's not doing the same stuff, but there is no like, there is no hierarchical level of worth that Paul is communicating. He's literally taking a slave and he's being intentional not to use the word doulos to describe them and just talking about him as a brother who's one of us. Right. And so, man, what an important thing for us to understand that um, nobody, nobody is more or less valuable than anybody else. Like we all have infinite value. And, and I think that is extremely important extremely important. It's really good. And I would encourage you, um, Philemon is one chapter. Uh, It is 25 verses. It's a quick read, but there's so much good stuff in there, especially now that you've got the context behind what was going on. I think if you've got a couple minutes, it would be worth running over there and reading that. Agreed. It's, It's at the back, the way back. Keep going. Uh, Not if, all the way. If you get to Revelation, you've gone too far. You've gone too far. <laughs> it comes right before Hebrews. Yeah. Cool. There you go. Awesome. Well, hey, uh, if you have anything else, feel free to drop it in the comments. If you have prayer requests, drop them in the comments. We'd love to be praying for you guys today. Uh, we've been praying for a number of things this week. Um, and then uh, just a reminder, like we will finish over the course of the next couple of days. We'll finish the book of Colossians. Um, and so the, tomorrow we'll talk about some more kind of key relationships, especially Epaphras, which, uh, as we mentioned, when we were doing the setup to this series, as uh, a very unique individual for Paul. Um, and then uh, we'll finish on Friday in verses uh, 15 through 18 with some specific kind of geographic reference stuff. So uh, there's good stuff. And I hope that really what it can allow you to do is when you come up to passages like this, you can kind of go, oh, you know what? There is something in this for me. This isn't just skim and move on. Uh, these words were inspired as well. So, uh, you know, just to, just to think about. Uh, Carol asked, what will we study after Colossians? That's a great question. <laughs> Uh, so we uh, this weekend, we're going to do Vision Weekend as a church. We're going to talk about what it means to cultivate growth in our lives over the course of the next year, individually and collectively as a church. We will be using the parable of the soils to do that. And then we are going to start a new series uh, called The Bible Says. And we're going to talk about this like bigger understanding of the biblical narrative. And so we've talked about this a little bit from time to time. But especially if you're newer to your Bible and you just open it up, it can be very confusing to understand how does all this fit together? What do I do with all of this? Like, why does Leviticus seem so different than what we're reading in Colossians? How does that all function? And so we're going to talk about this kind of like bigger scriptural arc, uh, creation, fall, flood, redemption, law, all that stuff. Uh, So we'll be doing that on the weekends and then we'll create, and by we, I mean Lisa, We'll create um, some parallel content that we will work through throughout the week. Have I said all that correctly, Lisa? Yes. Perfect. Yes, so that's what's coming up. Yep. God is still inspiring me on what exactly that's going to look like, but it's fine. I trust I trust that by then- It's going to be just he'll, fine. He'll have made it yeah. clear. Not the same kind of inspiring like God gave Paul to write Colossians. No, no, no. No, yeah. I'm not elevating myself like Paul. <laughs> I'm just saying I'm waiting. Cassie was responding to Greg said it was successful, but I'm having a lot of pressure and throbbing afterwards. Oh, I'm so sorry. Should be better uh, over a few days. So I'll just, I'm just going to take it easy and use ice a lot. 
I hear ice cream helps as well. That's what I've heard. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, being quiet this morning because my brain is just kind of consumed by this pain. Oh, I'm so sorry, Cassie. I, I get it. Uh, Pam, great reminder, looking at all people with infinite value that God created and our life is, and, and our, in our life's path. Absolutely. Uh, and then Becky, can you imagine how uplifting it must have felt to Tychicus and Onesimus uh, to have the person they are risking their lives for lift them up in this letter? I can't imagine it didn't fill their hearts and enable them to go on in tough times. Uh, how can I lift others up around me that gives them the ability to go on even when times are difficult? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, a hundred percent, Becky, there's I mean, they weren't they weren't making a photocopy, but I'm sure they were like, hey, let me just like make a copy of this by hand real quick. Just I'm just going to keep this with me. Uh, like I made it into one of Paul's letters. That's a big deal. Even in the first century, that would have been a big deal. Dom also suggests Rita's Italian ice for you, Cassie. Which so. if you've never been to a Rita's, they are good. a game changer. It's good. Strong. So good. Uh, well, hey, guys, this has been a great conversation as always. Just a reminder uh, we are uh, just a couple days out from Marketplace. So if you're looking to get involved this week, you can find out more information. They're looking for ready-made meals this week. You can drop off donations at the front of the church. There are some shopping carts out there. Uh, if you need help, want to help, know someone who needs help, reach out to them as well. Anything I'm missing, ma'am? I don't think so. It's tomorrow. I mean, both you and I have been a little Did messed I up. Today? Today. Today's Wednesday. Tomorrow is tomorrow. Thursday. Marketplace is tomorrow. Did I say marketplaces today? No, you just said it's a couple days away. So I just oh, want to make sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is this week is forever. It's so, uh, yes, marketplace is tomorrow, Thursday, because today is Wednesday, which would mean it's one day away. So, thank you. Yep. That's that. That works. <laughs> work. We'll get it. We're gonna get this right, guys. By it's Friday, fine. I'm gonna know it's Friday. I'm Everything's gonna, fine. I'm gonna know that it's Friday on Friday. So that's the. <laughs> That is the deal. All right. Well, let me pray for us and we will, uh, we'll get you guys on with the rest of your day. Let's pray together. God, thank you. Um, thank you so much for everything that you're doing in our lives, everything that you're doing in our world. Obviously we know you're sovereign, you're in control and you could, uh, make everything we're facing right now as a people go away instantly. Um, it, you know, Corona could be gone. Um, uh, the, the unrest and inequity could be gone instantly. And God, you're choosing to allow the things to happen in our world that are happening um, to stretch us. And then God, that we would be your agents of change in this world. And uh, it's ultimately for our good and for your glory. I pray that we would see it that way today. Uh, we pray at a, at a high level for uh, teachers and school administrators, people around the country um, where schools are getting started again. God, that you would help people not to be led by fear, um, but that they would rest in the fact that there is a bigger plan and a bigger purpose that you would keep them and students safe. Pray for Izzy starting her eighth grade year. God, that you would help her to have an amazing year. We're all walking into it. Um, not totally sure of what it's going to look like. Pray that you keep us flexible in the middle of it, trusting that we know who knows um, what's happening in the middle. God, we thank you so much for Cassie's successful injection yesterday. Pray that you would bring alleviation to the um, kind of swelling and throbbing she's feeling right now. And we pray for some of the things we've been lifting up all week. We pray for Dell, God. Um, we, we pray that he gets some good results on this biopsy this week. We pray for Greg's foot. God, thank you for some antibiotics that seem like they're working. Uh, pray that you would continue to help him rest and see that he be healed. Um, pray for Jeanette. Thank you, God, for uh, the, the relief in her back. Pray that that's still the case. And uh, pray for her sister's husband, God. And we pray for this this uh, neighborhood in, in Jennifer's life right now where they're grieving the loss of some folks and um, just unthinkable tragedy that's going on there. Thanks so much for the chance that we've had to be together today. Thank you for uh, these words that remind us of what real friendship and co-laboring looks like with other people. I pray that we would aspire to have those kinds of relationships in our lives as well. Thanks for preserving these words. I pray that you preserve them in our heart and in our life as well. It's in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. We will see you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m.